In the United States, in any given year, a quarter of the population would get a mental disorder diagnosis, and that's absurdly high. But the price of loving is grief, and part of the problem now is that we tend to uh, medicalize all sorts of human distress, and there, there's a tendency to see grieving is not a normal part of human, even mammalian experience, but rather as a sign of mental illness. There's, particularly in, amongst the childhood disorders, there's been a tremendous explosion of, of two diagnoses, uh, autism and attention deficit disorder. Severe depressions can be devastating if they're not treated uh, promptly, and um, very often medication doesn't work by itself. Dr. Alan Francis is a chairman emeritus of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University School of Medicine. He is an authority in the field of psychiatry and chaired the task force overseeing the development of the fourth edition of DSM. And DSM is akin to the Bible in psychiatry. Dr. Francis is author of several books including Saving Normal, which discusses the overdiagnosis of mental disorders. And that discussion is the subject of our interview. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe. And now we start. You wrote Saving Normal about a decade ago. What has changed in the field of psychiatry since then, if anything? Not much, uh, certainly not much for the better. The dilemma in the United States and in many other parts of the world is an overtreatment of people who may have psychiatric problems, but problems would, that would either go away by themselves or would go away with psychotherapy. Instead, many people who don't need medications are getting medications that have side effects and, and long-term impacts on their lives that may not be positive. On the other hand, in the United States and in many other countries, there's a neglect of the people who are um, really severely ill and who definitely do need medication, do need to have resources devoted to their housing, to their social situation. So we have this cruel paradox of over-treating people with milder problems and terribly neglecting people with severe problems. And in the United States and in some other countries, the result of this is the people with severe problems often wind up in jail or homeless because their treatment needs and their living needs have been neglected. Before we dig into uh, deeper into this discussion, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, DSM. What's DSM? What's DSM-4 and how you were involved in that? And why were you concerned with DSM-5? So DSM, those initials stand for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And basically, this is a clinical guide to the diagnosis of psychiatric conditions. Without having definite criteria for each condition, different clinicians would make very different diagnoses of the same patient. So it's a way of trying to put people on the same page by defining for each condition the, the criteria that are necessary to make the diagnosis. DSM is valuable if it's understood and used cautiously and within its own limitations. It becomes harmful if it's treated worshipped as a Bible and used in a rote checklist manner. The uh, problem with the DSM system over the course of the last 40 years is that the diagnostic categories have been expanded and the way people use it has been increasingly careless so that many people get a psychiatric diagnosis who may not need one. In the United States, in any given year, a quarter of the population would get a mental disorder diagnosis, and that's absurdly high. In the United States, in any given year, 20% of the population will be taking a psychiatric medication, and that's absurdly high. So that we're redefining many of the problems of ordinary life, the expectable aches and pains and distress and disappointments of ordinary life have been redefined by a loose diagnostic set of definitions and by careless use of those definitions so that people who would be better off without a disorder diagnosis are diagnosed and way too often medicated. And again, the, the tragedy of this is that for them, those individuals, it may cause more harm than good. And even worse, that the resources that are needed for the people really are desperately uh, troubled and often wind up homeless or, or in prisons, that those resources are diverted and misallocated. The, the worried well and mildly ill are overtreated, the severely ill are neglected. You mentioned that about 25% uh, of population in the United States are diagnosed with mental illness, and it's pretty high. What do you think would be the normal range? What number wouldn't bother you? 
you know, and that's a great question. And it, it's a, the answer is, is necessarily arbitrary because there's no clear cut boundary between mental disorder and difficulties in living. And so wherever you set the boundary, you could question for any individual which side they should be on. What, what is clear and what's pretty consistent around the entire world and has been pretty consistent number over the course of uh, the last 60, 70 years when there have been epidemiological studies is that about 5% of the population, 4 or 5% of the population has a severe mental illness. So for, for 4 or 5% of the population, no one would question that these are individuals who need help, who need treatment, who will ben not always benefit, but have a good chance of benefiting from treatment and will often do poorly without it. How much of the difference between that 4 and 5% and the 20 to 25% that are actually diagnosed is a matter of debate? And I don't have a clear answer, but my guess is that at least half the people who get a mental disorder diagnosis now, and, and probably an almost equal number of people taking medication, would be as well off without the diagnosis and without the medication. So my, my number would be, and it's an arbitrary number, would be probably more than like 10% of the population rather than 20 to 25. In the book, you kind of you quote uh, one wild statistics. I think more recently there is an increase in uh, children with autism by 20, 20 times. Bipolar yeah, the, is forty, and uh, ADHD yeah, yeah. is three times, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, what, what's happened is that particularly in, amongst the childhood disorders, there's been a tremendous explosion. Of, of two diagnoses, uh, autism and attention deficit disorder. And the reason in, in each case is different and, and complicated, but to, to summarize it very briefly, with attention deficit disorder, we know that there's wild overdiagnosis. How do we know that? There, there have been studies on more than 10 million kids in at least about eight different countries that show that the best predictor of a kid getting a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder is his birth date. Hmm. The youngest kid in the class is almost twice as likely as the oldest kid in the class to get a diagnosis. There's no way of explaining this other than immaturity is being diagnosed as a mental illness. That the kids who are disruptive in the class are being given an ADHD diagnosis. It's sort of an educational problem being turned into a psychiatric problem. And often enough, they receive medication for what may just be simple immaturity. The criteria for ADHD have been softened over time, and the people using the diagnosis have been increasingly careless. Uh, it's often a diagnosis that's made in the school system, and then some psychiatrists will go along, or family care physician. 60% of the medication for ADHD is prescribed not by psychiatrists, but by primary care doctors. So very often, the kid is disruptive in school, the teacher's worried about it, and they get a diagnosis from a primary care doctor in 10 minutes and are on medication. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, sometimes it's the parents who are worried. You may have parents who are worried their kids are falling behind in school, won't be able to get into the best college, seem to be distractible, and they jump to the diagnosis, and it's rubber stamped by very often a primary care doctor. So the rate of ADHD, which was before... Uh, the DSM system and, and before DSM-4, something like 2 to 3%. That rate is now 9 or 10%. And about 6% of kids are getting medication and a very high percentage, something like 15 to 20% of adolescent boys are getting medication for ADHD. This leads to a very large secondary market. So on college campuses, uh, the Adderall has become the drug of choice for staying up night to study for exams or for parties. There's a large secondary market. People can very easily get the pills through a primary care doctor or a psychiatrist, sell them to the, the secondary market. We've created a fad of first childhood ADHD diagnosis, and now it's extended to adult ADHD being wildly overdiagnosed. Uh, the diagnosis of ADHD should never be made unless there's been a childhood onset. Because in adults, there are so many factors that can cause distractibility. And almost every psychiatric disorder can cause distractibility. Allowing a widespread diagnosis of ADHD means that many adults are now being misdiagnosed and giving stimulant medication that may be harmful to their real psychiatric diagnosis. Do you want me to go on with autism or is that too much of a speech? 
No, it's great. It's great. Please. Okay, please with with please autism, start. before DSM-4, and here I'm responsible. I was the head of the DSM-4 task force. It's part of the blame, a large part of the blame goes to me, that before DSM-4, which was published in, in 1994, the rate of autism was between 1 in 2,000 and 1 in 5,000, and the severity was extreme. So you, there could be no doubt when someone had autism. The diagnosis was very easy to make. It had a terrible out, outcome prognosis, but it was restricted to a very small number of, of, of very, very um, disturbed kids. What happened with DSM-4 is we added a new diagnosis called Asperger's because the child psychiatrist said that many kids had severe problems with autism, but were not able to fulfill the, the extreme criteria in the manual. We did a field trial, then we expected to triple the rate of autism. So we thought it would go from one in 2,000 to 5,000, maybe one in 1,000. Very quickly, the diagnostic criteria we thought would work in real practice didn't. One, one of the things you learn in, in developing a diagnostic system is that once it's out in the field, it's never used the way it was used in the research studies that led you to include it never used in the way experts in the field use it in research clinics. So once out in the field, the, the criteria went wild, and particularly because there was a false claim that vaccinations were causing autism. It turned out that the, the studies were a lie, they were retracted, but they're still believed. And there's a strong anti-vax community. Robert Kennedy is running for president in the United <laughs> States based on a platform that's crazy, but basically saying that, that autism is caused by vaccinations. It's not. The studies have been very clear that there's, there's no causal effect between vaccination and autism, but lots of people believe it. The diagnosis is much softer and e more easily made. And so we now have rates of one in 40. Oh, wow. One in 2000. The rates, recent rates in different countries are like one in 40. And the diagnosis is being used very, very glibly and carelessly. Part of the increase is the, the diagnostic system is very liable to misuse when there are powerful financial forces of one kind or another that are driving that misuse. With ADHD, it was the drug companies advertising ADHD in the magazines, on TV, and that increased the rate of diagnosis. With autism, it's school services. The school services are mandated to provide very intensive and careful uh, education for kids who have an autism diagnosis. So if you get the diagnosis, you may go from a chaotic class of 35 or 40 kids to a very individualized program for five kids, or even for you personally. So there was a, an enormous school services benefit to having the diagnosis. That that's been part of what's driven it. And also there have been all sorts of for-profit autism clinics that uh, sprung up that provide diagnosis and treatment of autism and that make a very good living doing that. And so when, whenever you have a financial incentive for getting the diagnosis or giving the diagnosis, that will increase the rates dramatically. You can mention the internet also. So the, the internet is a powerful driver of fads and psychiatric diagnosis, provides very valuable information when used carefully for people. It's a great source of information for people, but it's also dangerous in spreading diagnoses loosely. If you people feel that they have a few of the criteria, they assume they have a diagnosis. And since um, many people are looking for an answer to explain their distress, identifying with a diagnosis is often a great relief. It reduces the confusion, the sense of being uniquely damned, and all alone in the world. And so getting a diagnosis can be, aha, now I know my problem. And many people jump to self-diagnosis in a way that would increase the rate because they wouldn't meet the diagnosis if there was a clear, careful clinical evaluation. So then these uh, people go to their physicians and tell them about symptoms and get prescribed a yeah, there, there have been a number of interesting studies in relation to the drug companies. They they were advertising not for the uh, benefit of people understanding their problems better. They were advertising to sell pills. And what they realized was that if you could sell the diagnosis, sell the ill to sell the pill, if you could sell people on the idea that they had a particular diagnosis, uh, the end of each commercial in the United States was ask your doctor. And studies showed that if a patient brought up to the doctor, 
I, I saw this ad and I, I'm pretty sure I have ADHD. The doctor was 20 times more likely to prescribe the medication. So the drug companies realized that selling psychiatric diagnosis was the most effective way. They never went on the ad and, and said, okay, we're, we're selling our pill. That would not work. But if you sell the diagnosis that triggers the prescription of the pill, that works brilliantly. And so what they did was become marketeers for psychiatric diagnosis. Similarly, with, with autism, it wasn't drug companies. It was more word of mouth, the internet, and school services, and, and self-identification because people who felt before that they didn't fit in, for whatever reasons, they and very often social anxiety, that having the diagnosis of autism became almost a, um, a positive rather than a stigma because it gave them the feeling of understanding my problem, and particularly with the tech industry making such a fetish of the brilliance of people with, with autistic diagnoses, it almost became a, a, a badge of honor rather than a stigmatizing diagnosis. But for some people, terrible. I've, I've had you know, dozens, maybe hundreds of people contact me over these years describing the fact that they got the diagnosis early in their lives, they got it carelessly, and the result was that they lost faith in themselves. They felt they'd never be able to perform in life. And it was only when they had life experiences, often going to college or getting a girlfriend, and became less shy and, and less um, disabled by anxiety, that they realized that they could do things that previously they thought they couldn't do because they had this autistic label. So many people, it turns out that the diagnosis of autism is very unstable and very unreliable. The criteria now is so loose that if you have two clinicians seeing the same patient, there'll be very little agreement about whether the diagnosis makes sense or not. If you have the same patient seen months apart, very often they lose the diagnosis. It's supposed to be a lifetime diagnosis, but very often the passage of time, the diagnosis no longer makes sense. And the best way of understanding that is that it was given carelessly at, at the initial contact. When we speak of mental illnesses, what percentage of them would you say are genetic versus acquired through life because of certain events? Yeah. Another way of putting it is that everything is to some degree genetic, but nothing is totally genetic. So we have a few more than 23,000 genes. We have 86 billion neurons, and we have several hundred trillion synaptic connections in the brain. There's no way that 23,000 genes can influence how 86 billion neurons work to create several hundred trillion connections. So a lot of what happens is set in motion by genes, but then the developmental phases require neurons finding other neurons to connect with that's not completely determined by the genes. And whatever happens after the egg is fertilized will be influenced very strongly by the genes at the beginning, but gradually the experience of the neurons, both the biological experience of the neurons and the environmental and, and psychological and stress experiences of the person will influence how neurons connect with one another. Neurons that fire together, wire together, and there's not a one-to-one -one prediction of, I have this genetic pattern, therefore my neurons will fire together and wire together. So the genes form a backdrop, but have only a small contribution to the psychiatric problems that most patients have. The more severe the problem, the more likely it is that you'll find a family history. And the more likely it is that genes have played an influence. But even in the most severe problems, suppose you have two parents who are schizophrenic, the chances you'll become schizophrenic are probably like 10 or 15%. So it's not, I have these genes, therefore I become this person. These genes are a risk factor for, for mental illness, but depending on how my life evolves, both biologically and psychologically, it, it's a matter of probabilities and luck how things will turn out. What is the problem in the field of psychiatry is that it became too biological about 30 years ago. And because there were interesting biological findings, fascinating uh, images of the brain, um, understandings of genetics, the Human Genome Project, there was a feeling that we could understand um, psychiatric disorder just by understanding its biology. Tens of billions of dollars have been spent and it's a failure. The, the human mind, the way the brain works is way too complicated 
for any simple biological explanation. And it turns out that the my guess is that we'll be going many decades in the future having fascinating biological findings, but not helping any patients. That none of the studies that have been done have been sufficiently powerful in explaining cause or sufficiently predictive in, in predicting effective treatments to actually help patients. And what we focused on too much is the biology of mental illness, not enough on, on the social and psychological factors. I was on the NIMH committee, National Institute of Mental Health Committee in 1980s that funded the, the early studies in cognitive behavior therapy and dialog, dialectic behavior therapy, two psychotherapies. Mm -hmm. Those therapies have now helped tens of millions of patients in the world. The funding for them was in the tens of millions of dollars. It was a very small investment that's led to tremendous help for a very large number, many millions, tens of millions of people. The funding of the NIMH, which shortly thereafter eliminated psychotherapy research and focused completely on biology and is now in the you know, maybe 50, 60 billion dollars of expenditure or more, that funding has not helped a single patient. So we have to look at people as people not expect to have a simple biological, this nerve connection went wrong and we can fix it with this drug. That doesn't work. We have to use our clinical wisdom, our wisdom about people. We have to be spending money on figuring out how to get people with mental illness out of jail, get them home so they're not living in, in on the street in the rough. That the research now should be focused much more on the real life problems of patients, not on the holy grail futile search for a simple biological explanation. You mentioned psychotherapy. Like, what's included in psychotherapy and why is it effective? Psychotherapy is a human relationship, mm -hmm. and human relationships are effective. That we're mammals, and the essence of being a mammal is attachment to other, other mammals, and that people, um, develop psychiatric problems for some combination of a biological vulnerability, but also for difficulties in their social networking, in their psychological functioning. And to the degree that psychotherapy provides people with a powerful relationship, healing relationship, an explanation for their problems, and a way of coping with them better, it's a very powerful tool. Now, psychotherapy works best with the milder psychiatric conditions that most people have. So the, the more severe conditions are restricted to that 5%. Mm -hmm. The difference between that 5% and 25% are people with gradually increasing severity of symptoms. When you get to the 25% or maybe even the 15%, maybe even the 10%, the milder and moderate problems are very uh, usefully treated by psychotherapy. And the advantage of medications over psychotherapy, which is profound with the severe problems, becomes reversed as you get to the milder problems. Psychotherapy is at least as effective as medications without the side effects and often without it having to be given over the course of many years or a lifetime. So if you take the milder psychiatric problems, person goes to the physician, usually on the worst day of their life. The physician sees them in 10 minutes, writes a disorder diagnosis and prescribes a pill. Easiest way to get the patient out of the office if you're a primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. By the way, primary care doctors prescribe 80% of medications. The easiest way to get the patient out of the office, write a prescription. Most of those people are going to be better in three weeks, no matter what. They're coming at their worst day. And just the uh, progression of time, regression to the mean, a sense of understanding, relation to the doctor, support from family. Most people get better from their acute problems without intervention. But if they've been given a medication, they will think the medication made them better. Mm -hmm. And very often you can't distinguish between a medication effect and a placebo support time effect. People will stay on medication for months and years and decades that they didn't really need because it seemed very helpful at the beginning even though the helpfulness came from factors outside the active. Most of medicine in the last uh, 2,500 years of modern medicine, most of the pills given, the treatments given by doctors were harmful. But doctors remained respected through these 2,500 years of often poisoning their patients because of the power of the placebo effect and of time to heal. And so what, what happens now is medications often used inappropriately in situations where watchful waiting 
doing nothing but just following the person and seeing what happens, or psychotherapy would be much more effective. When it comes to the very severely ill people, medication is essential. ECT is sometimes very useful or, or absolutely necessary. So for the very severely ill, biological treatments have a necessary essential role, but psychotherapy there is, is often a useful adjunct. What's an ECT? ECT is electric convulsive therapy, and it's the best treatment for severe depressions. The depressions that haven't responded to any other treatment often respond quite well to electric convulsive therapy. No one knows how it works, but it does work. And when it works, it can be life-saving and certainly um, career-saving, marriage-saving, because the severe depressions can be devastating if they're not treated uh, promptly. And um, very often, medication doesn't work by itself. And severe depressions typically don't tie to a particular event in life, right? Like grief can cause very uh, terrible... Yeah. It's yeah. very important that we not we not distort the um, understa our understanding of grief by assuming that all grieving people have a mental disorder. And the manual tends to encourage that now. Uh, grief is a completely normal mammalian phenomenon. It's not just in uh, human beings. It's in, and actually, it's also true in some non-mammalian uh, species that grief, losing someone you've been attached to, is normal. Not feeling anything to someone that you've been attached to once you've lost them would itself be more of a problem. And many people, that creates its own set of difficulties. They can never really attach to people. But the price of loving is grief. And part of the problem now is that we tend to uh, medicalize all sorts of human distress. And there, there's a tendency to see grieving is not a normal part of human, even mammalian experience, but rather as a sign of mental illness to diagnose it, to give medication. This has several problems. One is it reduces the dignity of grief. It acts as if you can take a pill after you've lost the love of your life and everything's going to be okay. It's ridiculous. It creates all the side effects attached to medications that uh, may not be needed and, and certainly are not the, the most specific or first line of of treatment. And it creates a kind of stigma, stigma that instead of your experiencing this in a way horrible, but also wonderful experience of reliving your love for someone you've lost, that you have a mental disorder. How many diseases were, in your opinion, basically almost invented, uh, which shouldn't be that way? Like I think grief for, and depression can be confused, right? How many more do you think that are like that? Again, it's, it's a fuzzy boundary. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't I'd frame the question differently. It's not so much that the diseases are invented, it's that the diagnoses are made too carelessly. Mm -hmm. Diagnosis is often made after 10 or 15 minutes with a primary care doctor or 45 minutes with a psychiatrist. That person doesn't really know the individual, doesn't have a longitudinal sense of their past, is not able to extrapolate into their future based on that one visit. But it's not that we have too many diagnoses so much is that there, there's not a sufficient attention to the fact that people are coming on the worst day of their life, mm -hmm. that if you watch them over time, if, if, if diagnoses were made over six weeks rather than six minutes, many fewer people would be diagnosed. One of the unfortunate things, at least in the States, is that the insurance companies require quick diagnosis. The, the, the uh, clinician will not be paid for the appointment unless there's a diagnosis on the record that justifies that payment. That's short-sighted and economically stupid on the part of the insurance companies, because once that diagnosis is given, it's tended never to be withdrawn. One of the ways I put it is the diagnosis should be written in pencil, not typed, that we should have the idea that they can be erased, that it's a useful idea to under-diagnose rather than over-diagnose, that when you're seeing someone in your office, you're seeing them usually at their worst that only with time will you be able to see how things will work out. In a world in which the um, diagnostic process took five or six sessions, I would guess at least half of people wouldn't get a diagnosis. So the, the problem is partly the definitions are too loose and there are too many disorders included, but it's mostly the diagnostic process has been made into a very short-term, um, not longitudinal view of the person based on too, too little information by a, a clinician who doesn't know the person, who sees them usually just for a few minutes. Obviously, when people are prescribed with this uh, type of medication, 
which make them feel better, they eventually get addicted, right? Or most of the time, how, what's the percentage of people actually get addicted? The, the medicines vary tremendously in the degree to which they're hard to get off. The, the worst medicines in psychiatry that I recommend never be prescribed in psychiatry are the benzodiazepines, uh, medicines like Xanax. These are very short acting. The dose for treating a person's anxiety is very close to the dose that's addicting. They make people feel good. It's like taking a drink of alcohol. Mm -hmm. They make people feel good. It's very easy to pop a pill and feel better in the situation. But then you gradually realize you need to pop two pills and then three and then four. The uh, two larger percentage of people who start these medicines become addicted to them. And then once you're physiologically dependent, it's very hard to stop. Whenever you try to stop, you get physical and, and psychiatric symptoms. You assume that those symptoms are part of the return of the original problem. You don't realize it's withdrawal. The people in the field have been way too uh, interested in prescribing pills, not interested enough in deprescribing pills. Uh, doctors are taught how to write prescriptions. They're not taught how to take people off medication very well. It has to, for the benzodiazepines in particular, be done very slowly tiny de decreases in the dose over months and sometimes years before a person can fully get over the pill. So the best thing is they not be prescribed. You can't tell which patient who gets a, a, a prescription for Xanax is going to later become addicted who won't be. So it's better not to use the medication at all. Psychotherapy is usually a much better substitute or the antidepressants. Now, the antidepressants are much less addicting, less of a pro much less of a problem, but they do have withdrawal symptoms. And so, again, you need a good reason to start them. They have side effects, they have complications, they have withdrawal symptoms. Many people who get started on uh, Prozac or, or any of the other um, serotonin-specific drugs or any of the antidepressants would do very well just with time, would do better with psychotherapy. So starting the pill is an important moment in the person's life that should be carefully thought through many weeks of evaluation before it begins a trial of psychotherapy. The pill should be started right away for urgent, severe problems, but not for milder problems. Urgent, severe problems, you need to get there quickly. For the milder problems, more evaluation and psychotherapy is a better first choice. And many people won't be started on them, therefore won't have the problem of withdrawing from them. So there is term of the addiction that's been used quite loosely as well. Like people say like they're addicted to their phones. The, the word addiction is charged. Like people hate the thought. I use the word addiction for, for Xanax or for um, Oxycontin or, uh, or the opioid medications because I really want people to be cautious about starting them. The problem with addiction is that, with the term is it's very stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. Individuals who are stuck on Xanax or on Prozac don't like to be classified as addicted because it lumps them with people who are using street drugs. And that's a very stigmatizing association that they don't like. I use the word for them as well, because I think it's really a good idea for the public to be warned about how dangerous these drugs are. Problem of addiction more generally is that we've tended to treat it as a crime rather than as a treatable issue. So Nixon, 50 years ago, when he was worried about the troops coming home from Vietnam, creating havoc in the streets because they were so often using uh, opioids that were very cheap. Uh, you could buy enough opioid to smoke it rather than to, to inject it in a zone where the poppies were being grown in adjacent fields. He was worried about this, and he declared a war on drugs, that we were going to have a war on drugs. It's led to the very dumbest policies over the course of the last 50 years with a, a tremendous efforts at interdiction, at stopping the drugs from getting into the country, which hasn't worked, and way too little efforts for treatment. More rational countries have focused their efforts not so much on making it a crime to, to, um, to, to sell drugs, and more on providing treatment for the people who are using the drugs. In our country, it's led to the criminalization of drug use and our prisons are filled with people whose crime was drug use, drug selling and drug use. It's been a hard, it's been racially um, discriminatory because the, the laws were almost designed to imprison blacks, not whites, making crack cocaine much more of a criminal offense than powder cocaine. It, it's led to an absolute social disaster in our country. All this was made much worse by the Sackler brothers who were psychiatrists who owned the company Purdue, 
and who sold through the most uh, horrible marketing techniques the absolute lie that um, OxyContin and then other um, of the opioid drugs that were give, delivered in a, a certain special way would not be addicting. They knew this was a lie. Everyone knew it was a lie, but it, we were very slow in coming to terms with it. The DEA and the FDA were way too slow in controlling this. The SACRAs were way too uh, criminally, to my mind, unscrupulous in the way they marketed. And it's led to, and it was predictable, I predicted it uh, 10 years ago, it led to a much worse drug addiction in the United States than we've ever had before. It led to a fentanyl addiction. Fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than heroin. Wow. So many of the people who were addicted by doctors using the marketing, following the marketing techniques of the Sackler brothers, many of those people could no longer afford the higher and higher doses they needed because of the tolerance to the pills they were buying from drug companies or the pills they were buying on the street. Fentanyl being so much more powerful than the um, other opioids is a lot cheaper. And the, uh, the Chinese cartels, the Mexican cartels, realized it was also very convenient to, to transport. You could transport a trunk's worth of fentanyl that would kill everyone in New Jersey. It, there's no way of stopping it because it's so potent. Very small volumes of it can have an enormous street value. So what they, what's happened in the United States is that the number of deaths from, from opioids has skyrocketed, with fentanyl now being the, the major reason for it. It started out being a problem with prescription drugs, which was severe enough, but now it's a problem with street drugs, exploiting the fact that now so many people are dependent on opioids, exploiting the fact that they can be so easily transported and possible to stop, and exploiting the fact that they're often now contaminating counterfeit pills with other labels. So the drug the uh, drug cartels have become very, very expert at counterfeiting pills, and very often providing a little bit of fentanyl in those pills will increase their popularity on the street. So you can't buy any pill, however it's labeled, on the street now and know that it's not including fentanyl. And since it's hard to handle fentanyl because it's a tiny amount can be killing, the pills themselves may have, one pill may have none, other, another pill may have enough to kill someone. And particularly since the pills are often used with other drugs like the benzodiazepines or with alcohol, the combinations are particularly lethal. So this last year, for the first time in history, the United States has had 100,000 deaths, by more than 100,000 deaths by overdose. And that's more than tripled in just the last few years. We can thank the Sackler brothers for that. And we can thank the fact that the fentanyl epidemic is, is uncontrollable and much more lethal than anything we've had before. Yeah, that's a complicated thing, and I see it on the streets of San Francisco, maybe a subject for another interview. So people who have mental distress, how should they select psychiatrist who has your point of view that there should be moderation? I think that what I said before about the internet being dangerous, but also being wonderful is very important. That It's very impor important to be an informed consumer to learn a great deal about whatever problems you think you have and to not accept in face value a 15-minute evaluation by a stranger and a quick prescription. I think that for people who are having acute problems, short-term problems related to stress, related to loss of support, related to grief, disappointment, it shouldn't be, oh, I need a pill for this. The first thought should be, it's probably going to get better in a few weeks. The second thought should be I should get into psychotherapy. That the use of medication for milder problems is now way overblown. And pe people need to be a little more patient. Clinicians need to be a lot more careful in diagnosing and also prescribing medications that can have powerful long-term effects. On the other hand, I'm completely for medication for people who have the severe problems and for people who have milder problems who've tried everything else and it hasn't worked. I get attacked by... The, to some degree, by people who think that I'm too critical of medication, but I get m many more attacks from people who think no one should be on medication. There is an essential role for medication for those 5% of people who have severe mental disorder. There's an essential role for medication in many of the people who are much milder in their symptoms, but where those symptoms are chronic and impairing and don't respond to other treatments. So I would often say to people, we're going to try psychotherapy for a month or two. If there's a dramatic benefit, which I expect there will be, we won't need medication. 
If there isn't, then at that point, we'll have a discussion about medication. Well, Dr. Francis, thank you very much for being on the podcast. It was very helpful. My pleasure. These have been great questions and pleasure talking to you.